a decision for them as to how that property should present itself each time. So recently I put a property on the market and one of the things that I did was he was a bachelor. Um, I gave him a laundry list of things he needed to do before he left the house in the morning. You know, we did some major cleaning before we put it on the market. Still needs lots of work. Came off the market and he's going to do some more work and we'll put it back on the market later on. And because we had 80 showings, I said we're too high. He said, I won't, I won't sell it for less. I said, then you've got to do a lot of work. You've got to get it up to snuff because the comments match what I'm telling you in the present condition. And so we're going to meet again this week, and I'm going to give him a whole new laundry list of the things that need to be done to get it prepared. And so preparation is 90% of your job because if it's prepared and it's priced correctly, and you've got great pictures to invite people to get there, it makes sense that at that point they're going to actually get it sold and they're going to be happy campers. And so um, in staging the property, uh, I have um, Corinne coming down to talk about some of the things that she does, some of the staging things that she do does with, with people's things, the pictures that she takes, she does a phenomenal job, right. and here she is. You're right on time. So um, do you provide a checklist for your clients when you go to meet them the first time? Do you give them a checklist of the things you want them to do? I have one. I would not. I've learned the hard way. I would not give it to them until I have signed, because why am I going to tell them all the secrets to prepare their home? So that they can prepare their home and then list it themselves, or or list it or with someone, someone, else. someone else. Yeah. Um, so there Heard is that lesson recently. <laughs> well, there is some. Uh, you just it's it's what they call proprietary, uh, you know, information as far as those. If they were savvy enough, they could go online and you know find all the ways to prepare their home. There are certainly things that once I have the contract that I would push on them. Um, I really think you should pay a lot of attention to the front door. Um, especially because when you're doing the uh, lockbox and whatnot, mm. buyers are standing there being recorded, so you don't want to move oh, too much. Okay. Um, it's okay, better. Over here. Uh, when you're doing the lockbox, the people are going to spend an extra couple seconds at that porch. And so, yeah, they're going to look closer at the light fixtures, closer at the patio, whether it's cracked or whether the papers are moving. So, make sure that you can stand on your porch for a few minutes. And not like is, you know, well, not just that, but like you're going to see where your eye lands, and then you're just then you're going to realize, okay, they might they might see that. <laughs> yeah, there's big cobweb on there. Hey, y'all coming, coming up to fix. Good morning. Okay. Um, so, anyways, that, I would say that, that that's a big one. Obviously, clean windows, clean light fixtures, um, carpet cleaning. Uh, those are the biggest return on your and that the decluttering. I push my also push my sellers for either um, to use a storage unit or a pot. And they're like, "Well, oh, I got a four thousand square foot house and I need a storage unit." I need your house I need to look like the dream. And your house doesn't look like the dream if the closet is packed, because then the next person coming in is going to be like, "We're going to be packed in here. This is a big enough space." Um, so loosen it up and get it out of there. And the other bonus of using a storage facility is that it allows you to cut the umbilical cord to certain things that you're not using. So pack up the stuff that you really don't use and then when it is time to move you're going to realize you don't even want that crap at the new house. So it's like a holding tank, desensitizing tank of things that you don't really need. Um, but as far as um, things that I think people generally don't pay much attention to when they're living in a house would be like the lighting fixtures, the baseboards. Um, you really want to look at your house with a critical eye. You get so much money back, return on investment, for just cleaning and decluttering. And, and those two things really aren't that expensive. Um, strongly recommend paint, uh, carpet cleaning, new carpet if it's, if you focus. And then it also just depends on your price point. That, that is something that I think I don't know if Lloyd Odello says it. I imagine everybody sells it. Price cures all. So, you know, if it's more important to them 
to just cut it loose, then you just price it appropriately or offer a carpet credit. But if you're in a price point where you're trying to, once you price it and find out your price per square foot, that's like for an average house. So then we're looking at a range of where that house would get priced. So a house without update is going to be lower in the range, a house with, with great updates and, and granite and, and, and the bells and whistles, it's going to be at the higher range. So if you have a seller who's hoping to hit the higher range, then I have to hammer into them, at this price point, at this square footage, we need an HVAC system. We need a uh, three-car garage. You need to start knowing your product. Know what at what price points do I get wrought iron spindles? At what price point do I get a Jack and Jill bathroom? Um, when you know those things, it allows you to price the house better. Um, if that's who they're competing, if it's a, if the square footage is the same, but they're competing against these these traits that other home that buyers are looking for, and your home doesn't have Jack and Jill, and your home doesn't have the spindles or doesn't have right. you know the things that are hot buttons right now, wood floors on the whole first floor. Now we got a price to compete. It's got to be priced so that they look the other way on those things that they were really hoping for. Oh, you, you didn't get a first floor laundry. You know. Um, so anyhow, those are just all factors to take in. Landscaping is a big, is a big one because it goes into curb appeal. Um, another, if, you, if you're looking for the cheapest things to do, Again, like I said, the windows, the cleaning, that mulch. Mulch really freshens up a property. It doesn't cost a lot. And um, like I have a kid who will do anything for like $17.50 an hour. Find that kind of labor and offer it to your people. Maybe they need a bush pulled out. You know, overgrown landscaping is another one. Nothing will say this house is from 1980 like shrubs that are blocking the house. Pull them out. Pull them out. Put in little ones makes the house look newer and younger. Uh, if, the, if, the, if the stuff is all overgrown and you can't walk through the walkway because the bush has grown in the way of the walkway, those gotta go. And I don't wanna say sneaky way, but one way of doing it is just cutting them down to the ground as low as you can get and then just mulch over. And no, it's unfortunate when the buyer goes to plant them, but, but it is a way to affordably do it. Because um, when they go to plant, they're gonna need to do that. Um, or it could decompose. Could. <laughs> but anyways, I did it at one house. And it just had to be done. The, the sellers couldn't afford to like pay to have them pulled out professionally. So my seventeen fifty an hour guy cut them down the ground, pulled the showroom. Um, and I had neighbors who instantly said, "We were so glad when you did that." Wow. I had neighbors who said that they'd seen for years that the bushes had gotten so big. People would live there and they're very, very old. Oh, yeah. And you know, they're just like it just didn't do anything for the house. It just looks un unloved. Um, so anyways, curb appeal, mulch just says a cheap one. Um, window cleaning, it, it doesn't hurt to get a list of vendors, like I think you had mentioned in a class before. Um, anytime you're here, especially you can easily identify like people that list a lot. People who list a lot have I didn't have a carpet guy the other day, so you know, I went and got I got three different names just in case because I needed it quick. So I didn't just get one name, give her one name and say, you know, use them because what if they set her an appointment that's two weeks out? So I'm like, here's three names. Whoever can get there first, <laughs> you know. Um, but anyhow, just ask around. Um, you do provide value. I've had people refer me on Trulia saying in the recommendation, um, you know, Corrine was instrumental in us finding our painter, our carpet installer. You know, you you had value. And you're more than just a, someone who put a stick in the ground or someone that unlocked a door. Um, you, you provide a service. And what's a nice thing is that if you do create these connections with the painter and the carpet cleaner and the window washer, you've referred them business. So what might they do for you? Right. So I had, a, I had a guy come out and paint, and he's like, you know what, I just did a whole house out in Milford. He goes, and I think they're, they're, they're doing it because they, they're thinking of stuff. Okay. So, you know, you want to reciprocate and, and use those, those connections. Um, did you have any questions?
Do you have a question? Uh, can you share some of your photo tips? I hear you're your the queen of taking photos. I don't know how that just sort of happened. Um, I, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was an award-winning photographer in France, and my dad was a, a photographer on my, on my dad, on my father's side. Um, so it does sort of come naturally to me. It is about framing the shot. Um, if it doesn't come naturally to you, there's tons on the internet, on Pinterest, on um, how to take real estate photos, and they'll give you tips. My tips are about be editorial. I've been a lover of home magazines since a very young age. You want your pictures to look like that. What angles do they take there? Do they, they don't just take a picture standing from the doorway. They work the angles. They, you, know, you know how to stand to get the best picture and how to tilt your head and what side to get. You, know, you want to start taking those things into consideration. Number one thing I would say the number best thing you can do for your pictures, go on a sunny day. And when you go on a sunny day, try to take pictures either at 10 a.m. or like 4 p.m. Those are like the golden hour because the sun is at such a position against the earth that you're not getting glaring blowout, okay? It's the same thing even if you want to take wedding pictures or a picture of your kid's first communion. If you're out, outdoor light is the best and the you know beguiling hours is either morning or evening. It, because you don't want this harsh, <coughs> direct overhead light casting shadows and blowing you out. It's just a softer, more golden angle of light. And um, you just, you'll get spectacular. I, I really feel that morning, like 9 to 10 a.m. on a sunny day, I could just hit the best look. Because like that, you get this, and the sun is at an angle where you're going to get that streaming light through the kitchen. So everything sparkles. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you, and, and like even in your own home, you know what day the light's best. <coughs> Ask the homeowner. What time of day is this house get the best light? That's the best time I want to be here. Um, lighting is probably the, the best way to improve your photos. Don't ever take photos at night with black windows. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, if you have to do something like that because of their schedule or whatever, I would bring lighting or I would hire a photographer for that. You know, if you have a tricky, if I had a tricky listing that I couldn't get good photos, hire them because they'll bring in the lighting or they'll do that, you know, a, an expensive one like I told you, they can do an overlay where they take a picture, uh, one, they take two pictures of the room and then they overlay them and take the best part of that picture and the best part of this picture and then they overlay them and it creates like pretty amazing. But that's professional photography, and that's a little more expensive. I would do that in a more, those were more expensive listings that we saw mm -hmm. that on. Um, and I, yeah, photography can get expensive if you were to, I would do it on more, on obviously, more expensive homes. Doing your own is, is economical. Take more than you need, way more than you need, especially if you're not that great at it. Because, you know, the odds are the more pictures you take, you're going to hit a couple good shots. Um, you recommend any particular type of camera? I really don't. Um, I would. I do say that it, I think my camera was like 300 or 350 bucks. But I mean, it is something. If you're going to be taking your own pictures, and you can write it off, um, I, I would definitely say it's it's going to give you an advantage over doing it with your phone. And depending on what kind of phone you have. Yeah. Because my son has some kind of Samsung whatever amazing phone, and his pictures are pretty good with that phone. So yeah, I, it depends on what you have, and and on how, if you know how to use it. You know? I can do um, um, <clears throat> what do you call that virtual tours. Yes, I've done that with my iPhone, and it actually looked very very good. Um, that is all about just staying steady, moving slowly, and keeping it steady. Um, and there are apps that you can actually use that will enhance some of the photos. Um, Any app? Do you use a wide angle lens? No. Just, no. Uh, I mean, not at this point. Um, it's come to the point where when I'm looking through listings, when I'm a buying agent, I know whose listing it is. 
Like I know a pernal listing, I know a rubber listing, because they use this, you know, every room looks like a bowling alley. <laughs> Um, and so, and I don't think, and I think you want the, it to show well so that you get them there, but I also think, like this is something Jim said too, I don't think you want it to show them so well that it's a letdown when they get there. Right. Right. So, and, and I, I was thinking about that when Jim DeMore said the other day that I'm, I'm actually thinking about sandbagging by maybe leaving one special picture out so that when they get there, they got a great surprise. They're like, oh my God, this laundry room is tricked out, you know? Or, you know, it, I did, this just happened. I was showing Lillian and Lillian Holmes over the weekend, and we stopped at one and just had the sign in the ground. We didn't have an appointment. And the people are like, could you get us an appointment right now? So I'm like, I call. And they, they, my clients walk, walk around back, and they look at the pool, and they see the lake, and they're like, oh, this is it. During the time that I'm trying to set the appointment and get a confirmation call back, they're in the car on their phones pulling up interior pictures. And just when I'm like in the process of confirming the appointment, they're ruling it out because the walkout, well, a little dated. If they had left the walkout pictures off, maybe the rest of the house is spectacular enough that they would have looked the other way. You know? So, like, if you have something that's not flattering, you know, leave it off. And if maybe, like I said, maybe if you have a secret, you know, like give them one picture of the yard, you know, but maybe the rest of it's amazing. You know, maybe there's more that's amazing, you know. Right now I have a listing where the pictures are too good and it's painful for the homeowner because she's been put out of her house 24 times without an offer. And it's because I've made the home and the listing good the house is great, it's the neighborhood that the house is in. And I can't, I'm like, what do you want me to do? Put a picture of your neighbor's house on the listing? I can't do that. Or put in the remarks in a sketchy neighborhood? And I can't do yeah. that either. <laughs> um, and it's not that it's sketchy, it's that the other homes, they're very well cared for. They're just small. The home I'm selling is 1,800 square foot brick, new. The things on either side of it are 1960, maybe 500 square foot sheds. Yeah, yeah. Um, great zip code. And you're getting a, it's only two hundred twenty thousand dollars, and you're getting a, you know master suite, jetted tub, walk-in closet, no carpeting anywhere throughout the house. Um, first floor laundry, maple cabinets in all kitchens and bathrooms. You know, there's a lot to the house. But there's something down the street that sold last year for like twenty thousand dollars. You know, and they're at two, and they're they are at two twenty-five. I just lowered it to two twenty. Where is this at? Farmington Hills. So there's areas where oh, they... Be off of by the fire department. Nine miles. Nine miles. Yeah, that makes sense now. Nine miles. Yeah. And there's just not a lot of people. And my seller won't open it up to FHA yet. Like, if they open up to FHA, then, then I think we get some... Like, they're just worried about FHA appraisal. <laughs> Although some, a lender came over and told me that I shouldn't be, that they would only be comparing it to things that were similar. But I'm like, they're gonna ding it for the neighborhood. They're gonna ding it. They're gonna if that house had that house on either side of it, the house would be like two fifty eight. So I felt like I've already dropped the price. A chunk for the neighborhood. But there's been feedback that says for certain people, like people who lived in Farmington Hills and other areas of Farmington Hills, not at any price. Not at any price. So it's just depending on the mindset, you know. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, if people, mm -hmm. it's, it's location, location, location. Price cures all, mm -hmm. but I think at a, at a certain point, you know, and these people paid 240 in 2005, 2004. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it's it, and she's keep, it's clean, nice place. Nice. I've held it open twice. Get a lot of traffic. Um, but, but anyhow, so you do what you can. I would say try, the number one thing is to get good pictures. It does get you out there. Um, yes, I've got 24 agents out there. I need a lot of showings because it's, I'm probably going to have to troll through a lot of people to find that one person who's going to be not going to care about anything. Just like, that. well, that's why I said the homeowner. Well, why did you buy? You know, what made you look the other way? She said, 
um, it had hard flooring through the whole house. Important to her. And she says, and it was all brand, and then it was brand new. She goes, it was brand new, it was at a price where we couldn't buy all that for 250 in Farmington Hills, all brand new. And even the things that maybe you could had carpet upstairs. So, you could have bought the ones with the carpet upstairs and put it in one of Right. You know? Um, but that's why, so we had this talk the other night, so I talked to her every day, Valor. Um, and I was saying that a lot of young people, she was trying to guess who her buyer is going to be, where they're going to come from, or who, who, would, who would be the type of person that would, it would interest. Like, it's a sort of target. That's what like it. Yeah, it's, I, it's got space. Um, anybody who maybe works here nearby, someone who works at Botsford Hospital, somebody who wants to be right there, um, or somebody who possibly has a relative a street over, you know, or maybe your mom lives two streets over, maybe this would work for you. But anyhow, um, I had said that young people have been coming, and I said, I, I, I didn't tell her this, but I feel guilty, at, because it will be a young, it could be a young person. A young person, <coughs> won't realize that this is a bad investment. Right, right. And, huh? Well, she admits it. No. She, the homeowner admits it. Because I said, would you buy this? I go, would you buy this again? <laughs> she's like, no. Because she's getting recording it. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, she paid yeah. She paid 240 She learned her lesson. Right. Um, I don't know. Now it's priced appropriately. Okay. She paid 240 If she got it at 220 we would be good. I'm honest. I'm honest to a fault. I'm honest with my clients, and I tell them frequently something that Diana Kokoska says. If what I'm saying makes you feel uncomfortable, it's because you know I'm telling you the truth. Yep. So um, people appreciate my authentic demeanor. It gets me a lot of business. I think that that is sometimes when it's difficult to sell something you don't believe in. Um, I do believe that that home has a buyer for it. There will be somebody who yeah. it will mean a lot to them because it, maybe they do want all those things in a home right. and they can't have all those things in a home in that zip code with their kids going to that school except for there at that price. So it will be the right home for somebody. So I, I mean that part I, I do believe in. Um, I just, uh, like I said, I think the original buyer, might have, well she knows she would pay. Um, but anyhow, I do think that People can smell liars. I can. And they can smell desperation. I never need a listing. I never need a buyer. If you look like you need business or if it comes out that way, I'll tell you, nothing, Coco Chanel says, nothing is sexier than the word no. So instead, I treat them like, maybe I won't take you on. I tell them in my listing appointments, if we don't agree on price or if you're unrealistic about price, I won't take your listing. Because what I do is sell homes not put signs in the yard and right. and, and wait <laughs> and, and watch people say she can't sell a house because that sign's been in the ground for a year. Um, so anyways, what's funny is the moment they think you don't want them or when I sign a buyer agency agreement, I will tell them I'm only going to sign it for two months because if I haven't found them something in two months, that we're probably not communicating well because I'm very good at what I do and I should be able to find them a home in two months. And then they're like, well, what happens if we don't? Like, well, we'll address it at that time. If we really need to sign another one and we both feel comfortable doing so, that's when we'll do it. But meanwhile, now they think they, they better <laughs> they better toe the line. <laughs> or because I'm good, I'm very good, I'm very responsive. I answer my phone, I answer my emails. I, I really do believe that I'm the right, you have to, you have to believe you're the right person for the job. And if you do, it will show, and then do it, you'll walk your talk. Yeah. Be the right person for the job, answer those emails. I had just, just looking at three hundred dollars, three hundred no, three million dollars in sales. That guy called me back. He wants to sell, not to buy it, but he wants also to buy it to sell his other two hundred, five hundred thousand dollar homes again. He'll sell those two and buy his two million dollar next house, all because I answered the phone first. He called two agents. The other agent, can I say on it? I can't say. Anything. Sure. The other agent, well, he has a kid. Yeah, well, <laughs> he didn't answer the phone. <laughs> uh, other agent was Jeff Glover. His answer was an email. I answered my phone. And uh, I just There's a difference. People want to connect. I'm looking at $3 million worth of business. Because you got to answer your phone. 
because you know it'll be the one time when you don't answer it that it's going to be that one fish. You, the more you fish, the more you show up, the more you do the work, the more real estate conversations you have. And I would say that would be my biggest secret because I'm not a huge caller. Um, have a lot of real estate conversations, tons of tons. Somehow, surreptitiously get the conversation on real estate all the time. And not in a cheesy way, be authentic. Because you are interested in real estate. Secretly, everybody else is too. Everybody else is. So start talking about some other city's real estate. And you're talking to your friend, start talking about how hot another city is. You're not talking about their city, talk about some other city. Start talking about highest and best offers. Start talking about, you know, that the interest rates are, 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 are low for right now and that you're seeing a lot of buying. A lot of buyers coming out because their freight rates are going to go up. I'm not saying you should buy right. You know, you're not telling them you should buy right now. The rates are going to go up. You're talking about somebody else. And then you just stop talking. I guarantee you, they're always going to say, well, "What do you know about this city?" You know, or you know, what's the appreciation here? How many homes are for sale there? And then know your stuff. Live on the MLS. That's what I did when I didn't have business my first year. Live on the MLS. Know the hot sheets. Know what cities are really selling a lot and what cities aren't. What markets are constricted. Because, um, like, is it really going to help you if a sub already has eight homes for sale and they're not selling? Is that a home you want to prospect in? I mean, a sub you want to prospect in? There's already a ton of competition. Go prospect in the sub that's got nothing up. You know what I'm saying? Supply and demand. Pay attention, drive the streets, where you, and your strongest strongest success is going to be where you live, because you're going to know it. And then know your sub names, know your street names. Here I've lived in Northville for 15 years, and I really just didn't really pay attention to what every sub is called. And you're at a cocktail party, and they'll say, oh, well, what's happening in Island Lakes? And I'm like, where's Island Lakes? You know, right. you know now I know. <laughs> but I'm just saying, it's stuff you can do on your own time, and you've got nothing but time if you don't have clients. So you get a map. Find out the names of all the subdivisions. Um, doesn't hurt to know like what sub has what HOAs, what subs have gated communities, what subs, you know, know things. Know your product. Right. What kind of square footage is in that subdivision? What kind of the, homes the, they put in? Exactly. Their proximity to landfills. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, know your know your product. Like I said, and doing it where you're from. It allows you to be authentic when you say, I live on such and such a street. I've lived there for 15 years. That's another thing, like, if you're not, you should know all the streets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you should know every prevailed by owner. So shame on you. Oh, you should no, know every he's, single he's prevailed. Too, he's weak as a realtor. Come on, give him a break. <laughs> One week. Two. Two. One week. <laughs> not just he you. Will. He will you know. know. <laughs> Leverage your assets. All your all your coworkers are gonna know where they are. Tell your coworkers, send me a text whenever you're on a route and you see a for sale by owner. Take a picture of the sign. You could leverage that. You could know every single for sale by owner. You could be first. That's the goal. That's you know. That's the goal. Um, it just you have to be creative about what what you have to work to, work to your advantage. Um, so like I said, drive drive the area. Know your product. Thanks. Thank you. Is that helpful? Yeah. All of it. I will get your desk. Huh? I will get your desk. You'll leave all black. They said the mailman was here. That was me. In case I have any more questions. <laughs> You're, yeah, I, and I'm right. Yeah, you walk right by my office, so pray everybody knows where I'm at. Because like to get to her, you got to walk by me. Okay. Good. Um, and I'm there. There's seven days a week. I was here all weekend. I worked all weekend. Um, and unfortunately. When you were brand new, what did you do all day when you didn't have business? Uh, either classes, classes. I didn't miss classes. I still come to classes. I still come. Um, because I'll tell you this, how else are you going to get one hour or two hours of a Mike Furnish time? One hour, two hours of a Jim Morris time? They know stuff. Um, and also just by being in the office, you're around an environment of sales. You're an environment around about you become like the five people you hang out with. 
people I came here every day, every day and sat in the in the walkway of, of Jim DeMora, Michael Pera, Mark Z, and you know, see, they come to work every day. You you want to make a real income in this? You have to work every day. The one day that you don't, it's like fishing. Like I said, if you fish every day, you're gonna catch fish. If you fish one day hours. a month, you're not gonna catch any fish. How many hours? Oh, you don't want to know. No, I do want to know. Well, that's what the other thing that's misleading about the. I had, a, I had a successful year, and I think it's very misleading because I probably worked double the hours that anybody would be willing to work. So it's really like I, I didn't sell five million in, in a year. I sold probably two and a half million, but then I worked two jobs. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I put that many hours into it. So even now, it's not unusual for me to have a 12-hour day. It's not unusual for me to be eight to eight. Um, I try. Used to even get here before that at seven. I used to get here at seven thirty. I really like to get here early because. Quiet. No one comes to work. You could really get a lot of the best. You can get a lot done after after hours, and then you get access to the bigs if you come on weekends, because a bigs is too busy to talk to you and help you. But if you're the only two people here on Saturday, captive audience, you know, and they're less likely to blow you off. Because you know, the other thing is, in the back of their mind, they're respecting that you're putting in the time and working when they're working. I think I got a lot, it's recording, but I'll, I'll say it out loud. I, I really, Michael Pernick gave me a lot of uh, encouragement. He was there for me sometimes when my ship was going down. And um, I think it's because he respected the fact that I was working so hard. I mean, I, I guess I like to think so. Um, but you know, I, don't ask, I don't think you're gonna have great results. If you show your face in here once a month, and then expect somebody to mentor you or give you their time because they're busy and they're going to they're going to invest in you and then you're going to flush out you know prove yourself at least so what did what did i do all day i lived on the mls i showed up offer your services to other agents you got a sign call you don't want there are you getting leads like truly or zillow leads that just really aren't your price point do you have anything that you know could trickle down you know you pay them a referral but you could pay them you know, because a percentage of something is better than 100% of nothing. And that's what you've got right now. And and not only that, when they got a little skin in the game, like they're paying, you, they're gonna make 50% off that lead, now you can go to them and say, help me write this buyer agent, this, this contract, or preview this document. They gotta help you, they get paid. I mean, they don't got it, but they will. They will, because they know, they wanna get make, make money too. And so it, it's a way, I saw, it, I saw it as an apprenticeship, you know? Because uh, you can't keep asking everybody to to give their time for for free. Um, so it's offer offer to hold open houses for others, and then when you do hold an open house, dress appropriately, be prepared. It's not just you know time to sit down and just babysit the house. It's active, engage, have a conversation with everyone that comes in, even if they say that they're you know. They're a neighbor, or, or they're just running through, or this isn't the right house. You still need to engage them in conversation. They may know somebody. They may be a neighbor that's thinking of selling down the road, or they might know the neighbor that needs to sell. They'll know if you get the conversation going. I don't say who do you know that needs to buy or sell. I say who do you know that's hiring out all their snow, their gutters, their lawn. Who do you know that's got too much house? Who do you know whose kids are gone and there are only two people in the big house? I'm like, just point me. Say, Andrew, you don't have to me their names. Point me to the house. You know, I won't tell them where I came from. <laughs> but it, it's just, it's, it's part of target marketing. You know, you want to be most effective. The other thing that you can do is you can go into PRD, find the people who bought their houses in 2010, 11, 12. Those are the, we've had aggressive appreciation in the market since then. Those are the people that are sitting in the most equity in their house go up to them and say, you know what, you got more equity than any of your neighbors. This would be a great time. I mean, if the market were to go down, you don't have that equity anymore. The market is up. You bought when the market was down. The equity is there now. If you sell now, you have the equity in your hot little hands. You know, and, and, and another one that they say is when the market is down, you want to trade up. When the market is up, you want to trade down. So now is a great time for downsizing because if the market is up and you have to buy another expensive house, you know, you're still gonna pay more for the next house, right? 
But if you're downsizing, you buy less. So there's just scripts, 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 scripts. And I never really learned them. I tell you, I never learned them. I end up making my own. And that's because if I'm having so many real estate conversations and going to so many classes, it just gets burned in your head. Do bold. Uh, anything Diana Kotkowska has to say, uh, any of her videos on YouTube, um, what is her, what is it, Sean, Sean Kotkowska, um, Mo Anderson can be very inspirational as well. I also suggest following any of those people on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Uh, on, Facebook, uh, on Facebook, there's all kinds of Keller Williams pages, like, or, like groups. I have learned things, found things out that are that are up and coming because the conversation is, is going on. And I, I think everything starts out west. Like all trends start in California and Arizona. And if something's happening like the way they sell, the way they market or or how hot their market is, you know, the highest amount, I think it's, it, it comes this way. And what's working for them? You can find out what's working for you. You know, and if so, maybe someone doesn't want to, maybe I don't want to tell you my secrets and how I effectively said sell them all. But there's no, there's the guy in Arizona who's a really, and the mentality of KW is to pay for you, forward. Someone a couple states away, they've got no problem sending me their listening presentation. they got no problem sending me their pre-list package. You know, it's harder to get here because you don't want your credit. Although Jim Demora did pass out a pre-list uh, last week, and you know that's that's a lot. You go to work, you work to get to get that down, to get it where you get the work, and then you just pass it on. Um, and a big big part of the reason why we do it is it, only one of you will do it. Only one of you will use the information. You know, tell you all day like how to knock on doors or how to go in and. Another one that's good as far as for finding clients, I know I brought there a lot. It's okay. Um, Blue leather, right? <laughs> look up leases that are nine months old. Their lease is going to be up. Maybe they don't want to lease again. They do want to lease again. You can find another lease, make a little money. But maybe it's time to buy. Maybe you explain to them now it is cheaper to own than it is to lease. But, but either way, a lease that, that, that closed nine months ago is up in three more months. And here's the other one more. I'm so sneaky. One more thing. <laughs> Go to PRD. Who owns that house? Maybe when that lease is up, they don't want to rent it. What is PRD? Public record data. Gotcha. It's real you go into public record okay. data, you can look who actually owns that house. And look for all the O's. And um, when you find out who actually owns the house, you can send a letter or try to call them and say, you know, I saw that you leased your property nine months ago and the lease is going to be up in three months. Have you considered either releasing or selling the property? You got nothing else to do right now. <laughs> um, How do you get the phone numbers? Spokio is one. One that's really, really easy. Um, it's just reverse lookup. It's free from the white pages. Go to white pages, use reverse lookup. You put in just the address. And pick reverse lookup, and it's going to look up uh, if they. And you, that that works with older people because a lot of older people still have a landline. Yeah. Um, and so that's one way. If you don't have a phone number, you could go in person. You got nothing else to do. You can knock, or make a flyer if you're too scared to knock. And I do this a lot. I'm always successful. Make a little flyer, and then handwrite a note on the flyer. And then just put that on the mailbox because now you are this mass on, producer on on not in yeah on the mailbox on, right. you can put it on the front door front door or or you could Stay make from the mailbox. you could make the door you could print the door hanger thing it's like a it looks like a little rectangle with a thing you could print those you could print those and just write a handwritten message on the back of those um, when you door knock it helps to add value I would show up when I door knock with a, a list of the active souls and pendings. Because now I'm not an annoying realtor that wants to sell their house. I'm someone who has information they want. If someone knocked on your door, it's, well, now you have access to the information, but because you're realtors.
But if you were a homeowner and someone knocked on your door and said, I have a list of everything that's active, pending, or sold in your neighborhood, and it has a breakdown of what the price per square foot is and how many days each home took to sell on the market, and you'd be interested in that, would you, would you like me to leave it with you? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, sure. Who do you know that wants to buy or sell it yourself? <laughs> and then you start laughing, right? And they start laughing. You know? Say, Hold on. Hold on. Who do you know that wants to? And this, I do the same thing at my open houses when I ask people, um, this is the sneaky way to find out if they got a realtor. How many homes have you seen so far? Oh, a couple. Of, so, you, so you've gotten into some homes. You, with the, they were all open houses? Yeah, they, they were all open houses. Well, bingo. All they've seen is open houses. They're not working with a realtor, right? So then I say, oh, so all you've seen is open houses. So, so you're not working with a realtor, right? And they're like, well, no, we haven't really decided if we're going to move, whatever. That's when I'm like, with my card, shamelessly with my card. I just said, I, I really don't want to meet you once you have a realtor. That's what I tell them. I want to meet you now when you don't have a realtor. And they, they laugh at that one, too. They just like this. You're no, and then I was like, you're no use to me once you have a realtor. <laughs> and then they laugh. You, you, if you're shameless about what you want and add some humor to it, it's authentic. I am authentic. I want their business. I'm not lying that I want their business. You know, it's just, you, it's going to take some months to not feel like a sleazy salesman. And I think that's the hardest thing to get over, is that sales can sometimes feel, I still feel like I'm bugging people. You know, they don't want me to call. They don't want me. Stephanie Janica was always telling me they do want you to call. They want your help. You're good at what you do. You want them to get somebody bad? You want them to be somebody else? Call until they tell you they don't want to talk to you. Because you don't have a listing anyways. You don't have a listing anyways. My other thing is that if, if it's really painful, start in a city where you don't know anybody. <laughs> you know? Seriously. You know? Because you might, you might suck at first. But if... Success comes from a lot of failure. And success comes from the, the, the guy who failed the most and got back up. That's success. That's, like I said, I, you gotta go. I went on a lot of side calls. A lot of side calls. And I'll tell you, that, that, that was an intense training for um, learning how to qualify your prospect. Now, I, I can get a, a, a pre approval or proof of funds almost every time before I show home. And that, that's, that's, you gotta make it sound like that's normal. Right. That's normal. Yeah. And you guys know the script for that, as far as, you just, if they, if they come into your open house and they're not pre-approved, and it's a, a man and a woman, you say, getting a pre-approval doesn't mean you have to buy a house. It doesn't, and there's, it's free. But not having one means you can't go look. And I say, because if we do, and I find her the perfect house, and you don't have your pre-approval writer, and two other people think it's the perfect house, you just, and I look at the man, you just lost her, her house. And I go, and she's gonna blame me for that. And then, and then, and I'm gonna blame you, because now I gotta go find you another house. This is so now both of us don't like you, all because you didn't get married. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what everybody does. Yeah. And they laugh. And then I said, would you be interested in the name and the number of a competitive lender? Yes, we would. In the back of my phone. I don't have one now because I gave them all out of my open house yesterday. I keep a lender's card right here. And that's actually my lender's number as well. So that if I don't have the card, I have the screen cleaner. It's a little screen cleaner. My lender's phone number on it. But soon I'm getting my own. I'll be able to screen clean your phone with my phone. <laughs> I don't even want one. Um, but anyhow, humor goes a long way. Doing it, open houses, I did a ton of them. I would say that's where, where my success came from. Get out in front of people. Be yourself. <coughs> follow up that I, I don't have free follow up and I did and I did really well. So that just shows you how much I mean leads I must have. Because I'm not great, great, great at follow up. I'm able to take this huge bucket of leads and pick the winning horse. You know. Who's, who's gonna go all the way? So you don't waste time with the other ones. If I had, if I use systems, and KW offers you systems, if I use, if I leverage the KW favorite word, if I leverage my E edge, I could be dripping on all these people and, and maybe following up with that seed that wasn't ready then. 
Buyers are seeds. Sellers are seeds. They've got to germinate. They're seed. They're thinking about doing it. They're not ready to do it. So we walk away and we ignore it. But maybe a couple months later, that seed's poking its head up through the ground. Now it's, it's time. But now you don't know where you left it. <laughs> and I, I mean that literally. Yeah, it's class. <laughs> and I mean that literally. You don't know where you left it. Um, You'll understand when you go to our office. <laughs> Don't judge me. They're everywhere. <laughs> Don't judge me. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I saw a quote on, on LinkedIn the other day that said, focus on what you're good at. And, you know, because if you focus on what you're bad at and try to improve that, you're going to put a lot of time into getting average at something. And if, I, if you just focus at what you're good at, you're going to become amazing at something and hire someone for you back then. You know? So instead of constantly beating myself up about the fact that I hate mundane daily tasks of data entry, or follow them, um, I just got to just keep, keep getting out in front of people. And I just move. If I move my price point up, which is what I'm doing at like a rocket science pace, you move your price point up, you have to do fewer transactions. It's easier to keep things straight. If your price point's down, you got to do a lot of transactions. You got a lot of things you want. You know, but I started in leases. I did several leases. It's not fun, but they need houses too. Um, and the best part of best part of leases is you are still creating a client base. That lease, they don't have a house yet. They're gonna live somewhere eventually. Stay in contact. I I had two really 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 good leases, and if you're leasing at a really high price point, that's better than selling my house. Because I'm making a commission check every every 18 months. <laughs> but um, it's just showing up. Showing up. Being here already, you're ahead of how many ever people they sign in when you sign on. Because all these seats should be full. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank on to your job. That's all right. Really, all over the place. Wasn't really good. prepared. <laughs> I know. I she, she in, in her defense, I asked me. about an hour ago. So I said I, I want you to share some of the things that obviously marketing your listings is a big piece and making sure that you know what you need to do, how you need to stage the house, how you need to take pictures. All of those are critical pieces. Um, I also want to show you there's a supplement to Ignite that. Um, I think it's a very valuable piece. It has a number of pages, you know, 30, 40 pages of tools that can go right along with what we've been going through with all of your Ignite, Cla Ignite class. And so if you go to um, Keller Williams University, and go to Ignite, what happens is this section of toolkit files actually will open up Upstairs, so let's see if I can get it to open up down here. Um, but I started to look at some of the tools that actually are part of this training. It's it's in here, but it would be a very succinct supplement to what you already have printed. And so, for instance, um, you can see that there's a whole laundry list. My database daily 10-4. Ignite success tracker, some place that you're going to be keeping track of the calls. What are the four habits? Those four habits you're keeping track of, right? You know how many properties you've previewed. If you've been, yeah, 10 a week. So if we're doing 10 a week and we're sending 10 notes and we're talking to 10 new people and we're talking to 10 people in our database, you know, how many people are on your weekly tracker? so that you know whether you've done all of your homework because there's definitely a list of homework that comes with Ignite. And I would be um, amiss if I didn't bring that to your attention on a regular basis. Problem, problem solving guidelines, do you think that might be helpful? So as we're going through, you can see there's a buyer lead sheet. Um, so there's a number of tools in here. As I started to look at them, that okay we need to make sure they're aware of it so you can download them here's your your daily tracker 
and right right next to it. You can print that and carry it around with you. This is your database. These are your ways to build your your business, your success tracker for the week. Making sure that you do all of those. Um, can you imagine if you were consistent and you talked to 50 people a week? How many how many is the conversion for your share for your sphere? What's that conversion ratio? How many people do you have to contact before you find a lead in your sphere? Is that 35 to me? It's 12, 12, two leads for every 12 people that you talk to after you've been in a 33 touch program. So touching base with them right now might be a lower ratio, but it will turn into that 12 to two. How many new people they say 50 to 1 for new people. So if you're, if you're planning on meeting 10 new people a day, so out of the 50 that you meet this week, one of them might be a lead. But if you don't do it, how many leads are you going to have? And so that door knocking is absolutely critical. That open house, that um, stalking people in the store, <laughs> whatever you need to do to meet people. I mean, we don't meet, meet people when we're in the office that we can sell a house to, right? Not in this office anyway. But you could meet people in the elevator. Are you talking to those people? If they're going to a different floor, they're probably not an agent. Start a conversation. You see some of the same people over and over and over. Um, funny story, Kareem has actually sold people in the building houses. Okay, so that's a clue. Success leaves clues. And so you want to make sure that you're actually doing some of the things that others have done before you. So you can see that the tools are phenomenal in here. Oh, that took us to a page. That's success tracker milestones. I think the next one was classes that you're taking, keeping track of those. It's in your um, your passport to success. Starting to keep track of who your allied resources are. Um, she mentioned she has somebody that takes out shrubs or she has a handy person who will work for $17.50 an hour. Maybe they need trees trimmed. Maybe they need bushes trimmed. Maybe they need um, somebody to clean their house. All of those people that you meet on a regular basis, what do they do? What if you what if you started using some of the people that are in your radar to use them for their expertise? Do you think that, that they might look at you as an expert when real estate comes around? So trading those services are, are a pretty big part. Um who who is that? allied resource. And you're building a whole host of allied resources. There was business checklist. These are all the things you need to have as tools so that when you're ready to go out doing business, you have all of these things. How many of you, if you got a listing today, would have a sign and a lockbox and open house riders and all kinds of things to actually do business. We have some here that you know we can let you borrow and things like that when you're when you're really strapped for cash. But if you're not having some of those tools already ready, another thing you might want to um, this is a list of previewing homes, and it has a tour home tour checklist. So as you're going through, you could make comments yourself so that you begin to see repeat things that people are maybe not staking their house properly so that you can actually visualize some of the things that you would have done different in that listing. I know um, when I was talking to Corrine the other day, she said, I went in to do an open house and I moved the furniture around because the flow pattern wasn't really 
conducive to having people come around. She said, I went back two weeks later to do another open house and they never moved the furniture back. So you see, to have an eye like that, you might want to ask permission, but um, <laughs> she asked for forgiveness, I'm sure. <laughs> Not permission. And so um, keep in mind, though, <coughs> Not everybody has a good eye for those things. And so when you're going through somebody's listing and you're seeing things that are out, things that you would have encouraged your people to put away, um, moving, moving things around on a, on a bookcase, you know, you've got it all sloppy looking, straightening it up and making it look nicer. Presentable is critical. And so that, those are the things that we were talking about earlier, but absolutely very important to know that you know what needs to be changed so that when you get ready to list a property, you can see, oh, well, I showed this one and it was just pristine. Okay, what about it was pristine? What areas were they very succinct in what should have been done? And so, Marketing your listing is having that visual eye to be able to um, make sure everything is like it should be. Um, the, this is a nice, nice schedule. Focus on your database. This is when you meet someone. When, what do you do? What are those actions? Um, select a farm. What things are you going to look at for that? So you can actually go through through here. There's your 411 form that you asked about earlier, Jay. So your 411 form is in there. And what part of Ignite is that? This is the Prepared. toolkit. Okay. Wanted to make sure everyone knew where the toolkit was. So you're going to just go in. It also has your GCI for your My Goals, setting that up, and how to actually figure all of that out. <coughs> conversion rate. So if you made a connection um, in the first week and you talked to 10 people every day, so you have 50 people, and you got no appointments, you see what your conversion rate is. So you're actually creating your own chart to see what your conversion rate is for how many people you talk to. Remember I mentioned the gentleman who knew exactly how many doors he needed to knock for the year? That's that's what he knew is his conversion rate. One out of three, so 7,000 people that he actually met created 300 transactions a year, which netted him a million dollars in commissions. So he knew 21,000 people were the ones that he needed to actually go out and try to connect with. Out of those 21,000, 7,000 of them he actually did connect with, and 300 of them turned into an actual transaction, sell or buy. And so in that, he knew exactly what his conversion rate is. You need to get to the point where you know, okay, I know that I need to stay on the phone every single day or I need to be out there looking every single day until I've talked to, he knew he had to talk to 35 people physically every single day in order for him to get the appointments that he needed to have 300 transactions for the year. And he's done it four years in a row. So it's not a science anymore. It's actually, this. these are the physical numbers I have to take care of in order for me to get there. And so creating that conversion rate so that you know where you're at, you can see whether you're uh, getting better if you're doing it weekly. Um, problem solving guides. So we were talking talking about, you know, obviously you've got ways of communicating with people. You need to know what's best for them so that you can make sure you connect with them on a regular basis. Um, you can do a survey with them when you're all done. So the tools that are here, the buyer tools, here's a lead sheet. Somebody asked me for one of those the other day. So what do you use for a lead sheet? Well, this actually is a lead sheet that you could use in conjunction with your buyer consultation. So when you're all done, you've got the answers and they've got the consultation book. So it's got two pages worth of questions, and buyer questionnaire that could go along with it. Am I 
a 10 plus buyer service agreements for buy strategy together of the things that you intend to do with people on a consistent basis so that you you start your real estate business with the end in mind okay in order for me to get someone from I just met you to a closing table what kind of things am I going to do to actually help them see my value and give them the best experience they could possibly have and so there's a checklist for that. <laughs> yeah, I told you you'd like this. Oh, yeah. Okay, prepare to show homes checklist. So you need to know, what am I taking with me? Then prepare to make an offer. There's a checklist for that. So those are the toolkit checklist for writing an offer. That's page two. Five must-haves. So if you're sitting down, that's with your buyer consultation. What are your five must-haves when you're buying a house? Um, my expectations, what I expect from all my clients. Contract to close, there's a chart for that so that you know exactly where, where am I in this process. Here's a closing packet introduction letter for buyers. This is what the transaction is going to look like. I'm sorry, can I interrupt for a second? Mm -hmm. It goes according to this, but it is a little different. Um, I went and met with a client and uh, a buyer, and I got my document signed. Mm -hmm. Buyer agency? And, mm, buyer agency, my uh, agency disclosure. Mm -hmm. So now I'm preparing to show them houses. I sent them the email went through uh, and looked at, you know, checked off what he liked, what he didn't like, different things like that. So he got the little light bulbs and all that. So I emailed him when he really wanted me to start, you know, when he wanted to see the houses and everything. But this is my issue. I have to uh, upload or turn in the uh, agency disclosure and the exclusive agency agreement. I you don't have to turn it into anybody yet. That's for you. Right. But you're going to scan it into God look. Well, that's what I meant. I meant to say that. I meant, okay. I meant to scan it in. But uh, you can't do that here. Yes. Can you? On what computer? Uh, the scanner upstairs. There's across the hall from where my office is mm -hmm. in the big area. There's a computer. There's a printer over there, and you just walk up to it and scan. Put the two sheets in there, and mm -hmm. you're going to email it to yourself, and then you're going to upload it. How do you, okay, um, how do you, I'll walk you over there and show you. If you're not connected to that. Do you, you don't have to be connected to that to do that. To email it? Right. If your name's not on the list, you can manually put your name on the list. Wow. It'll okay. let you put your email in. Okay. Okay? Yeah. And it'll come to you as an attachment from KW140, okay. our office. Okay. Okay? So we'll get it in there. And right now, because you don't have a name for the the um, property that they're going to buy, I think we talked about this. Your name and it their their last name first, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, and you can always change that when they when you find a, a house. Okay, would I want to change that, or would I just leave it? No, you would change it to the street address with the street first name number second. All your loops are going to be street addresses. Okay. So then seller, to, seller tools, very much the same. So you can see that a checklist for reviewing an offer, if it's your listing, there's a pre-listing lead sheet for you to keep track of the people that you're working with. Pre-qualifying form. Home evaluation form lots and lots of tools that are here that are going to help you um, stay organized in a checklist manner. <laughs> Sign me up. Sign me up. <laughs> See, listing consultation checklist. So that you know you've covered everything. Mm -hmm. and you know what that looks like so that people, so there's, I don't know how many pages of this there are, but if I were you, I would go in and print them all because then you would actually have all of the pieces. We go through them through class, but 
um, having them in your booklet for class and having them completely independent as a document that you use over and over and over. Um, I know I, I have used the home checklist when I preview properties or I make a copy of it for my clients so that they can make notes on it. I give them a buyer flyer, I give them one of those, gives them an opportunity to write notes about each particular property that they're looking at. And I encourage them to keep it in a booklet or I give them a manila folder and let them keep it in there so that they have all of the properties as well as I do. I write down all the MLS tickets that I've shown because nine times out of 10, it's gonna be on the market down the road and they're gonna say, I wanna see this one since you've already seen that one. I need to know that because I'm not going out there a second time unless it's for a second showing because they thought maybe they really would like it. So don't you remember? This is what you said about it when we were there. Would that be valuable for you not to have to go back out there again? Yes, that had a sump pump. Yes, the basement had water at some point. That, that is why we left. You know, if you know what those things are that were their big no's about that house, you're not showing it again. Um, so, open houses obviously is a way that we're going to be making sure you're marketing your, your property that you have listed. Um, there's problem solving guidelines that are in this booklet. Um, it was also on here. So any questions about marketing your listing? Now in your presentation, in your listing presentation, there is a page that says you do 14 things. You need to look over those 14 things and make sure you do them because if you don't do all of them, don't put it in your listing presentation. So one of the examples is an IVR, IVR, is that what it is? IVR, it's an interactive voice line. One of those things yeah. that you drive by and turn yeah, radio to a Yeah, you can station. turn your radio or it's got an 800 number and it's got, you know, this is the number, this is the pin number for you to hear about the house. You used to call it the talking house. Mm -hmm. It's on our listing presentation that says we do that. If you're not doing that, don't put it on there. You can adjust what's on that list of the things that you're willing to do for a listing and you want to make sure if it's on your list, you're doing all of those things. And so, pretty critical to make sure. <clears throat> so, we're going to move on really quickly to contract to close because obviously, this contract to close chart that's on page 17.7 <coughs> gives you a real clear focus on what happens when you do an offer and what all the pieces are, hence another checklist. And so it makes it very clear what those things are that you're going to be responsible for and when. And so that's why I said downloading those flow charts and having them as a guide to what you're doing throughout the transaction so that you know exactly where you are. I have a, um, I have a deal that I'm working on right now and the, the title company sent me an email, welcome email, thanks for your business, we appreciate it, we, we would love to keep you abreast of what's going on so we'll give you status reports on a regular basis. I got a status report from the mortgage rep. So I'm, I'm now adding the other real estate agent and the title company to that status report so that when it goes out, everybody knows what's going on. Isn't that more, much more valuable? Also a very good use of my time. I'm adding those people to that status report so that they know we get our appraisal in. They know when, when they're turning it in for underwriting. They know when the title work is completed and everything's cleared on the title work, everybody knows what's going on in the transaction and I don't have to be that person putting all of those emails together. And so we can, we can actually use some of those things to create um, 
clarity in your transaction because you want to make sure your transaction is bulletproof and the way you do that is making sure everybody knows what's going on and so you don't want to have an inspection today and the answers out there dangling if you get an answer from your clients that everything went well and they're fine to move forward you're letting everybody know okay the inspection's been completed and everything's fine same way on the other side, if you have someone who does an inspection on your listing and they find out, you know, there's everything is fine and we're satisfied, we're moving forward, it's really good to send the seller a note that says, okay, we're fine. So that status update goes all the way through to anyone that's in, in that transaction. So you want to make sure uh, clarity is power with closings. If everybody's on the same page all the way through, there's less likely it's going to fall apart. So you have a perform your agent responsibilities contract to close checklist on the next page. I have a question. Yes. Um, so the title is there before the loan is approved? Um, actually, they're, they're clearing title from the time you put it on the market. If you list a property, the, one of the first things I do, once I get it all turned in and everything's, I have all the documents, I go ahead and order title work. So most properties have a, have a title work begun before there's ever an offer on it. Then what's happening is they are issuing a preliminary title from the owner to the new owner, subject to these things being cleared, the loan being paid off, the taxes being paid off, the water bill, those kinds of things. And so they're working on clearing the title right in conjunction with the purchase. So once you have a purchase agreement on something, you wanna make sure whoever's doing the title work, it's been ordered, number one, if they haven't ordered it, now is the time to order it. So they're clearing it while everything else is going on. It's really good to know early in the transaction, for instance, one of the deals that I just wrote is a trust. Well, it'd be really good to know for sure that the right person signed the purchase agreement. Is the trust up to date? Does it have all the information in it? Do they have all the documentation? So I sent an email this morning to the title company and said, okay, since we're using the title work on your side, I need to know, did the right person sign it? Make sense? So we wanna make sure that that's the case. And so all the way along the line, they're getting clearances for everything that's on the title work. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then there's a checklist for the buyers. So you want to make sure when when you get it. So that's on on 17.9 or 17.7. Then we go to 17.9, and then listing agent contract to close checklist. So you've got a checklist for each each segment of who's responsible for what. You've got a contract to close for issues, for problems that might have come up for the inspection. And how you deal with any issues on 1217, how you deal with any issues along the way for any of the other things that could go wrong. So each, each step of the way, if you're staying on top of, um, loan approval and funding. You can see that there could be issues. There could be delays. There could be changes in what type of mortgage there is. There could be um, issues that happened after a purchase agreement was written. There are a lot of things that could happen to the transaction and solvable things if you're on top of it. So that next section
Commission talks about an introduction letter on, on 1714, talks about an introduction letter, one for buyers, one for sellers, um, closing 101, guide for buyers, guide for sellers. So you could create your own packet of things that you prepare for your sellers. And you can have a lot of these things done ahead of time because you're going to go in and you're going to make it yours. Um, copy the contracts that they're going to be involved in. Uh, I like to give my clients a packet of documents that they're going to be signing when we do find a house so that they can just go through and e-sign it. Very simple. If they have never even seen a document yet, sometimes they really want you to sit down with them and go detail by detail by detail. If they've had an opportunity to read them ahead of time, a lot simpler. And so um, I make sure that when I meet with my clients to list a property, that they have a full set of documents. If, if they're, most of the time they're not e-signing those, most of the time you're taking those documents with you. If I take them with me, I take a set filled out to leave with them. And then they know all they did was sign everything. They have a complete copy of everything that they've signed. So you can see you have everything you could possibly need in here as far as tools go to be totally prepared to be working with buyers and totally be pre prepared working with sellers. And customer service is going to be your highest aim. Obviously, you want to make sure everybody's clear and you haven't left a stone unturned. The more efficient you look, the more you've prepared your packages, the more you know what's in there, you know, you know what all those steps are. As you're preparing them, you're looking through them and, and you're becoming very familiar with what that transaction looks like. So if if one of your first transactions were the house that you bought and things didn't go smoothly with your sale, you're thinking that's the way it always goes. You can change that thought pattern so that you're creating a situation from the beginning of your meeting to the end of how you want that client treated. If you bought a house, you know how you got treated during that transaction. And so if you want to change those things, or if they did something really great and you thought that was wonderful, um, in here on page 1725, there's an idea to sit down and figure out what type of token gift of appreciation for doing business with you might, might look like. You've heard me say before, um, I have beads that I buy for a bracelet for one of my clients. She gives me leads on a regular basis. When she does that, I'm rewarding that and that effort. Um, and then at closings, I show appreciation for a number of different ways. You could have gas cards, you could have dinner dinner gift cards, you could, you could send a basket, you could send edible arrangements. Some of those things are not totally deductible. In order for you to be able to deduct what you give out, it, is, it either needs to be $25 or it needs to be advertisement. So when you move over to advertisement, that might be something that's branded. I give my clients a closing gift of Cutco which is branded with Keller Williams and my name and phone number. And so that's advertising. So all of that's deductible. So if I'm dealing with someone that's buying two, three, four hundred thousand dollar houses, I want to make sure the gift is um, matches the commission, a value for that. And so that's where those, that's where those numbers come from. Um, movie tickets, gift baskets. So think about that. Be you sitting say, down. You say there's an actually a ratio that you use as far as close? I, I do in my head. It's oh. not really a ratio 
Yeah, okay. it's not really a ratio. Sometimes um, it's a young couple and they're just beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that sometimes it might warrant buying a home warranty for them. So they needed to be really good clients. Yeah. It needed to have a price point that, and I find that I'm more, I'm more generous when I've capped because I'm not spending as much money for um, our split. Mm -hmm. So it's all relevant, but I try to make sure whatever I give them is deductible. So you, branding was very important. Do you always give a closing gift? I always give a closing gift. I give a closing gift, or I give a gift to the, if it was a referral, I give a gift for that, and I give a gift to the client who actually closed. Mm -hmm. Yep, I've always done that. Not everybody does. Uh, that's a choice. You get to choose what your business model is. So that pretty much takes care of both of those. They kind of go together. And with the tools that you can download, there's very little left unsaid without, with all of the checklists that are there available for you. And so not going to keep you forever question about uh, printing all those forms. So we could pull it up on a computer upstairs and send it to a printer and print everything off of those things? You certainly could. Okay. Um, and you can do 500 black and white pages a month. Yes, and that's what I thought. Give yeah. me a month's worth. Yeah. Is our month listed on one of my pages I saw my start date? Mm -hmm. Is our month from that date to the next? I or think is it's it the from beginning the first of the month. Thirtieth? I think it's first to the thirtieth. Okay. That's a good Kristen question. It's okay. not a Debbie question. I'll send her an email. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I know it was a long morning. Thank you. So I didn't want to keep you hours and hours past. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Got to buy more binders and print more pages. Yep, buy more <laughs> binders. <laughs> Lots to actually keep track of around well, here. I was talking about the different personalities, and I was just kind of reading inside what he was talking about. <laughs> the different styles. <laughs> okay, how do you stop the recording on this thing? Is it there?